everybody. I am so excited for our second workshop. We are here to talk about when is the right time to pursue a graduate degree? I mean, you are all professionals in your careers. You are all potentially thinking about it or are already in a graduate degree, or maybe you're considering pursuing an additional graduate degree if you've already got one. This is an extremely pertinent and relevant topic for anybody who's thought about more education. This workshop is for you. I'm really excited for you to experience our guest speaker this evening. It's going to be really insightful, very data-driven. It's going to have a lot of facts and figures that will hopefully make the, help you make the most educated decision about what makes the most sense for you. By the way, my name is Garrett Mintz. I'm the founder of Ambition in Motion. And really, you've already started meeting with your mentor. That is awesome. Hopefully, you've already set up your first meeting. Maybe you've even already set up your second meeting. If that's the case, that's amazing news. But the focus for this workshop is how can you be intentional about really taking steps forward for yourself professionally. Now, I know that these workshops are on a wide array of topics. Obviously, our first workshop was on how to transition into a managerial role. This workshop's about determining whether or not it's worth it to pursue a graduate degree. But I really want to challenge you that when you're in your mentor meetings that you are customizing it to your experience for what you want to accomplish with your own career. Because I recognize that some of these workshops are more relevant to you than others. And that's, by the way, completely okay. We bring in really amazing world-class guest speakers to come in and, and be our guests for these workshops. And that's fantastic. And, and the ideal goal is that it, all of them are relevant to you, but I recognize that it varies. And, and some workshops are going to be more relevant to some people than other people. But what I want you to recognize is that even in this workshop, even if you feel like it's not the most relevant to you, that there's a lot of nuggets. There's a lot of topics that we talk about with our guest speaker that can, I believe can apply to a lot of situations that you may face in your life. So I'm really excited to get started. Now, one thing that I really want to focus in on, and this is something we talked about last time in our workshop, and that is understanding your strategy, your story, and your state. Those are the three keys to being successful in this program. The most important one, that being state. So physically, where are you? What is going on in your world? Are you having a bad day? Are you having a stressful day? Are you having a difficult time with your significant other? Did your dog just die? I don't care what is going on with your world, no matter how stressful, no matter how bad, no matter how angry, no matter how bad anything is going on in your world, you can change your state in a matter of seconds because your emotions drive your emotions. So what I want you to do right now to get yourself ready for this workshop is I want you to stand up and I want you to shake it out. I want you to shimmy it loose. I want you to scream at the top of your lungs. Just go, yeah, just let it loose, let it out, let it go. Because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're letting blood flow to your brain. You're releasing endorphins in your brain. You're getting yourself into a state conducive for receiving information because ultimately at the end of the day, when you sit down for too long, you have diminishing returns on your mental investment. Your likelihood of retaining that information is significantly minimized. So I want to challenge you to get up, shake it out, let it loose, get your blood flowing because your blood's flowing to your brain. Your likelihood of actually remembering this information is significantly higher. Now, when you're going into your mentor relationship, when you're meeting with your mentor, if you can get yourself your blood flowing before those mentor meetings, you're much more likely to retain the information your mentor has to say for you and to you. But if you don't get yourself into a state ready for this mentor relationship, your likelihood of making the most out of that experience diminishes. So I want you to get yourself into a state. Now, the next key is your story. What is the story you tell yourself? Why will you be successful? I'd love to know it. In fact, actually, if you could, post in the comment section, why are you going to be successful? I mean, if in your mind you think, hey, I'm, I'm cool with mediocre, I'm cool with just settling, this program is not for you. I can tell you that right now. If you're thinking to yourself, hey, I just I want to settle, I just want to kind of like not really aspire for too much, you wouldn't be in this mentor program. So what I'm here to tell you is shoot for the stars. Have big, crazy, hairy, audacious goals. And by the way, don't let anybody else judge you for your goal because your goals are your own. So what is audacious to you may not be audacious to somebody else. And what is audacious to somebody else may not be audacious to you, but that is okay. It's not for you to judge. It is for you to make strides for yourself because at the end of the day, this program is about personal growth and confidence, helping you put yourself into the best position for you to succeed. So if you can tell yourself a story for why you will be marginally to exemplary but it's significantly better than where you're at at the beginning of this program. That is awesome, and that is where I want you to go. That's where I want you to be. Now, the last part is your strategy. What is the strategy that you're going to do to start putting yourself in the best position to succeed? Now, this program, this workshop specifically, is about when is the right time to pursue a graduate degree. Now, one thing that I strongly encourage you to do, because here's the thing. At the end of the day, your strategies are all about routines, both we think about routines both in the bad sense as well as the good sense. Bad routines are, you know, 
things that we consider habits, bad habits, they're bad. But we, we typically have a negative connotation around habits just because of so many bad habits we've heard about. But there's a lot of things and a lot of beneficial things with good habits. So what are things that you can do on a daily, regular basis that helps you prepare for anything that you want to be better at? That is what I want to focus on. So one strategy that you can implement is implementing a SWOT analysis on a monthly basis of your life, of your career, of your higher education experience, of anything. Doing a SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. So if you're currently right now in a job and you're thinking to yourself, I'm contemplating a graduate degree, but I don't really know right now. What you'll want to think about is what are the strengths of of pursuing a graduate degree? What are the weaknesses of pursuing a graduate degree? What are the opportunities of staying in your current role? And what are the threats to leaving your current role for this graduate degree? If you can lay this out for yourself, it will help you on a substantial level towards making the most educated decision for yourself for why you should or should not pursue a graduate degree. Now our guest speaker this evening is gonna talk about the, little, the literal specific facts and figures of financially, when does it make sense for you to get a graduate degree and when does it not make sense for you to get a graduate degree? And so I think you're gonna really enjoy what our guest speaker has to say about this because uh, the insight is unbelievable. I think you're, you're gonna really enjoy it. But in terms of the strategies, I want you to do a SWOT analysis to help you prepare for that. The other thing is I want you to start having more informational interviews beyond just your mentor. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what stage of life you are in. You can have conversations with people. Just because you're not a quote unquote current college student in the in the in a collegiate sense, you're still a student of life. You're still a student of 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 professional outcomes. And by being willing to admit that you're still a student, you can take the knowledge of somebody else. You can say, hey, I'm I'm a student, I'm interested in learning more about XYZ field. Would you be willing to have a coffee with me or a conversation with me? That is a great conversation starter for you to learn more about other fields because at the end of the day, it's not about stagnating, it is about growing, it is about learning, it is about being uncomfortable and being comfortable with being uncomfortable. So those are the key points I really want you to take away from our workshop this evening. I'm so excited to jump into our guest speaker. By the way, if you've not connected with me on LinkedIn yet, please do so. We have a LinkedIn community, a, a Ambition in Motion group, where all of us participate in it. We can post our questions. Our entire community can answer them or see them or relate to them. It's a really cool place to be. If you don't have a LinkedIn, absolutely get a LinkedIn. If you do have a LinkedIn you have not connected with me, I strongly encourage it. I'm so excited to get started, and I'm so excited for you to experience our guest speaker this evening. Thanks for your time. I'm looking forward to get this guest interview going. Hey, everybody. I'm so excited to dive into our topic of for this evening of when is the right time to pursue additional education. So you all might be thinking to yourself, okay, I just finished my degree or I'm about to finish my undergraduate degree or I'm about to finish my master's degree. And I'm thinking to myself, is it worth it to pursue that master's in maybe information systems or master's in accounting or that MBA or a PhD or any other additional education you might be considering to pursue? And you're weighing the cost, you're weighing the benefit. Is it going to help you in your job prospects? Does your employer know about it? There's all these factors that are probably running through your mind. Well, fortunately, we've got a great resident expert here with us today. We've got Henry Pinzon to tell us about how he has been able to leverage getting additional education, pursuing different opportunities for himself. Um, but before that, Henry, do you mind just introducing yourself to the students? To, to, sure. To better All right. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you and with the students that will be watching this video. Um, it is good to meet you all. I'm Henry Pinson. I currently work with Cisco Systems. I have been a professional for more than 20 years, and I have whole um, bachelor's and master's in business administration. Uh, we aim fo when focus on international business. Um, that's a little bit about me, and I'm looking forward to the conversation, Gary. Good, awesome. So, tell me about your career trajectory. You got your undergrad, you started pursuing career, and then you went after a master's. What was your career? What was your career trajectory like? Why did you determine it was important for you to pursue additional education? Like, how? What was the decision making process like? But before you even tell tell me that. Tell me about your first job, your education, why you pursued that degree path. I'd love to get into the nitty gritty of why. Oh, yeah. You so my my story um, starts when I moved to the United States and I had under my arm my bachelor degrees from Columbia in business administration. So my first job in in the United States was um, a finance was as an accounts payable manager 
in a restaurant chain um, in Boston. And why is because the education that I have got got me to that point. Numbers, thankfully, are very universal. So there was no barrier of entrance of language. Uh, my English back then wasn't what it is today. So there is always to talk about education, even from the language perspective. So the first thing that I did when I moved to the States from the education perspective, once I had a, a good position in place, was to spend a great deal of time on improving my language. So I, I used to live in Boston back then, and I used to go three nights a week to the extended education Harvard programs to study English. Um, and I did that for three, four years as I was continuing working. Then, because my career was stagnant um, with the degree that I had already acquired, with the knowledge and the development that I had already to the, comp the positions that I had, I still, it was evident for me that to move, continue moving forward, I needed um, credentials that were well accepted by companies in the United States. So um, it has always been an objective of mine to comp to acquire my MBA. So that's what I did. I I got into an executive program with the Northeastern University in Boston, and that's when I got my my MBA. And since um, I have been able to progress through my career, different positions, different industries, and even different areas within the business, because it gives us the flexibility to it gives me the flexibility to 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 touch many areas. That's awesome. No, I, so I love that. Um, tell me, I want to, because there are definitely some students here that are not English as a first language and are also uh, immigrants here from different countries. What was that process like from going from getting your degree to getting that job was, you know, what were some of the visa or difficulties in terms of just handling maybe getting that first job in the United States, which I've just heard, obviously, as an American, I, I can't relate because I don't have that issue or I haven't had that challenge. Uh -huh. What was that like of just getting yeah. that first job in the States? So so for me, the, the papers, visas, legal documents were not an issue um, since I have all that um, above board through other paths. But what it was definitely hard was to get that job. And the way that I got the job is like many, we start from the bottom. So I, my original position or like position that I have referred to you guys before, it was an accounts payable manager. But my first job in that restaurant chain was as a host. So I started as a host and I built my career within the organization for, I don't know, it took me like a year maybe to go from when I started as a host to be the accounts payable manager to later on being the financial controller of the company. So I think it just shows the progression um, through the business. But what is very important to highlight is my, my resilience towards work. You know, like you gotta work hard. <laughs> there is no other way around it. Like you, you gotta be able to utilize what you learn and you, uh, you have studied, but you gotta put commitment, time and hard work. And I think that's how I managed to get to that first job through a lot of hard work. Did you choose Boston because you wanted to be in Boston or was the job there and they were like, hey, come to Boston if you want it? No, I ended up in Boston because I have um, acquaintances there. So that was the best place for me to start it. In terms of finding the job, I did that on my own. Um, so, so, but yes, I, I had um, I, friends and I wasn't, I was familiar with Boston. Yeah. You mentioned that your career was flat at a time period. So it sounded like you you moved up from being host to accounts payable manager to, to full-on controller of the entire restaurant group. That's a big deal. It doesn't sound flat to me, but what what tell me that timeline. Like what when did you determine like okay, I need a step forward yeah. and it doesn't look like there's any more steps forward here for so, me? So so I moved from that uh, first uh, restaurant chain into another restaurant chain that is owned by the in by an English venture capital back then called Wagamama. And then I joined to help them to open their business as the financial controller of the U.S. to oversee the investment. And I had a fantastic time working with them. But after a couple of years, I noticed that the organization wasn't moving as fast fast as I would like to, nor I was gaining any additional knowledge about anything. So after four years, five years in the restaurant industry, the complexity is low when it comes to understanding the, not, the, understanding the business. The 
the complexity is high on the execution. But on my end, um, since I was on the back observing what the results were, the planning and results were, I just I just had no much to learn there. Um, so I feel like it was very flat and I wanted to explore other, other areas, industries more than areas. And that's why I decided that it was time to go and, and get an MBA. Sounds like you've got a very entrepreneurial mindset. Like you, when I say like there's entrepreneurial, which is like startups or, you know, starting a business, but entrepreneurial is innovating within the organization itself. It sounds like for you, and I'm not, I'm paraphrasing, but it sounds like you almost get bored. If it's like the thing is this static and it's just like growth and steady. And, and there are some people that love that. It's like consistent. They can kind of just keep the steady innovation going and keep doing similar things over and over. But it sounded like for you, it was like, all right, man, I've been here for four years. I'm ready to either explode this, bust this out to the next level or move on to the next thing. So so you're right. And the four years cadence that you actually define or, or refer to it, it's actually much aligned with my career progression. Um, it is all, every four years, most likely that I will change a job or change an organization. Um, I, I think that when you join an organization, depending on the size, but your first six months to a year, depending on the size, is just like surviving. Like what is going on here? You're trying to figure out a space. Who do you work with? What is it supposed to you need to be doing? What is the relationship that you have with your leader, your peers? You know, trying to figure all that out. Then after that, you have two more years where you can ramp up and actually do serious contributions, like bring your best A game and tackle some solid goals. But then on the by the fourth year, I, I think... I think people need to question, like, do I want to do five more years of this thing or what am, what am I doing? And, and I think that's what's mentioned or if you refer to as own your career, you know, like, where do you want to take your career? And for me, education was the primary way to do it. You know, just by going and acquiring new skills, then coming back to the organization and bringing those new ideas um, that actually yield positive output for me while I was studying and working in the organization. Um, and of course, after, uh, when I ended up leaving, once I got my, my MBA, um, well, the new organization was the one who got the most amount of the benefit. Yeah. And from, from then it has been just a story. That's awesome. Um, did you pursue your MBA because like maybe, so you get that four year itch and you're like, okay, um, this is, fine but i don't see myself being here in the same position five years from now so did you start to interview for places and did they kind of come to you and say hey we're looking for you to have an mba or at least hire so what wh why yeah i was gonna say what kind of it, it seems like it would be more cost effective and easier and less time consuming just to go into getting into that next elevated position versus going to get your mba why choose the mba route versus the uh just taking the yes, next just continue moving forward so for me it was it was um my roadblock I, I had two or three roadblocks that were very evident on, on that place where i needed to pivot my career number one is it was my my language my business technical language okay number two was my network like the people that i didn't know that i met in a school and then i wasn't expanding my knowledge so when i put all those three things together the easiest path for me, yes, expensive, without doubt, was to get into a good university, good, choose a good program, get accepted, get to meet fantastic peers that now are part of my network. Yeah, um, As I had to read as hundreds and hundreds of case studies, my English just got better. Uh, and it, hasn't, it has just got better since, but that was a breaking point, forcing yourself to be interacting with this very technical business acronym language is not something that you just learn overnight. And because I didn't have the opportunity to study undergraduate here, for me, a lot of it was just a translation, clarification, um, plus an evolution of concepts that I have already studied in my undergraduate. Um, but that I, I managed to accomplish that because I did the MBA. That's awesome. I think you highlight a really interesting concept that I think a lot of students are contemplating when it comes to getting their degree, their master's, their MBA, pursuing their next level, virtual or in-person. You talk about the power 
of the network of the people that are in your MBA program, which I think this is very valid. I also think though, there's a lot of students that are like, hey, I just want to have it on my resume. So I want to quickly and easily. And, and there might be a variety of factors for that. It might be because they've got a family, they've got kids, they've got a job. They just can't uh, do physically the in-person MBA program. But from your perspective, do you feel like you might be doing yourself a disservice by not having that in-person experience with fellow classmates that are also eager to learn and grow? I think, I think personally, I think you, you, you're you missing on it, um, especially dependent on the composition of the program. But for an MBA in particular, when they set the cohorts and they create the groups to work, um, as most business schools do, um, who do you work with and who do are you pair with? And that makes the difference. Um, and I think it makes a difference then as you're learning and it makes a difference 10 years later af as, uh, after I graduated and I still very good friends with, with my classmates. Um, so I, I think there is that to say now. If you are getting a master's degree on a different subject, for example, computer science or data analytics or code development or architecture, whatever it is that you that somebody wants in that space, like on the technology data development space, I don't think I don't think a a person a face to face interaction is most needed um, because the skills is what's going to make the difference. Yeah. Um, however. I do believe that it's important for any person in in uh, in an educational institution that is part of an educational institution to leverage all the connections and programs that the school or university has to connect with employers ahead of time, with potential mentors ahead of time. Because one thing is getting the degree. It doesn't matter if you do an MBA or a master's on something else. And then how do you go and apply it and, and get that opportunity? So I think I think it depends. To be honest, but in the more technical stuff, I, I argue that the face to face is not a must. That's awesome. No, I appreciate the context there. And I think you I appreciate you clarifying the differences between an MBA and a master's and maybe something more technical. Um, did you ever consider going to your employer and asking them to pay for your MBA? I did. I did ask them to pay uh, for okay. the MBA. the The answer was so because my employer was an English is an English company, yeah. So in England, education is free. So if you go, you want to go get your university, you can go to a public college and get your degree. And yes, MBAs and some business schools are very expensive, but you don't have to spend or invest a lot of money in to get uh, an MBA from a from a good business school in England. So when I communicate to them what the cost of the education was in the United States, um, yeah, it wasn't well received. Um, it was just hard for them to understand. It's like, how is it that this is possible? I'm like, well, that's how the system works here. So it is a financial investment without doubt. Um, I, I think it's worth it. I think um, from the, as, as soon as I graduate and I had my, next opportunity i doubled my income just just by having the credentials and with the credentials getting the job um which i wouldn't have been able to do without the credentials so so i think it's worth it um in my experience i, I don't think every case is the same but when when you uh, study for a reputable organization that has a very clear objectives on where they place their their uh, alumni and they care about that. It is um, it is intrinsic that you leverage it and use it. Do you have a formula or a cost benefit analysis for determining what is the value, like how much you need to earn from earning this MBA and spending this much? Because I only ask this because there's a variety of circumstances that I've seen from students sometimes, not always, but sometimes where they'll be working for an employer and they won't tell their employer at all that they're going out and getting their MBA. They're doing it maybe virtually. They'll, they'll do it online, whatever. And they'll do it at night and they'll work hard and they'll get their MBA. And then they finish that degree. They get that piece of paper and they show up to work the next day and they're like, ta-da, I've got this MBA. Where's my rates? And they're like, nowhere. Or even though, yeah, what are you talking about? Like, you, you yeah. Know, you know, an MBA. What is happening here? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think so. That's that's a very interesting point, and I have seen it happening. Uh, 
it ha it happens <laughs> to people that I know. Um, so first of all, I think it's super important to get the support of your employee employer. If you are doing it and you are employee, like I was, I was doing, I was going to school full time and working full time. So my employee was aware 100% and supported 100%. So that that gave me the time to balance my work and, and academics. Um, and that was very good. Then having or getting the diploma and showing up with it is not going to give anything to anybody. If the organization has been paying for it, then most likely the organization has put you on a path forward to get promoted or to move to the next level. They have identified you as an early talent and they want to invest on in you. But when the organization is not paying for it, I think the most logical expected result is that you will find another place to work once you finish your degree. Like, I think, I think getting a degree and staying where you are might as well, why did you get the degree? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about that. It's it's like, hey, I got this degree. They're like, bonus. We were about to put you on a performance improvement plan. We were like, you're not getting your work done. We were wondering what you were doing at night. And you're like, well, I've been working my butt off on this degree. We're like, well, I yes. guess that's why these reports haven't been getting done in time. There's no way we're giving you a bonus. In fact, we still might need to push on this performance improvement plan. But uh, I guess with what you're saying, it's it's very valid and very fair. And it's and it's actually fascinating because I have seen students where they will get that MBA, they'll work in their job and they're like, oh, really? The pain of having to switch jobs is way too difficult to, to, than to believe where I'm going. It's like, why was it worth the pain to get your MBA in the first place? How is the activation energy high enough to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get an MBA, but not to transition jobs where you can be active at, accurately accurately compensated both in time uh title and in salary based on the degree that you have um so yeah I, I i don't know why do you think students sometimes uh not not get to that point so i think it has to do with how old are you when you go through grad school mm -hmm. i think grad school uh in particular for for masters in, in business they they demand um, if you have work experience, like you know, say seven, five to seven years of solid work experience, then you have a better understanding of what you want to get out of your program, and then you go for it. As a result, people that walk into those programs that have this background, most of them are they know that the next step is moving up. Yeah, that's one thing. They, I think, it is important also to refer, for example, to professions where masters are needed to move forward inside the organization. A great, a great example is accountants. So accountants, they got to have bachelors and they got to have masters and then they got to get more stuff on top of it. They don't have to leave their organizations, but they are because they are encouraged actually to acquire all the certificates and all the credentials that they have to. So that's one case where actually you probably want to stay, get paid, and then um, grow with the organization. If you are starting a job from, if you finish undergrad school and you went straight into grad school, and then you have suddenly a grad school program, a diploma, you will have the same entry level job that the guy with the without the master has. Because at the end of the day, you don't have any work experience. And I think, and I think that's also important to consider where do you do those marks and when do you acquire them and how do you get the ROI on it? My view on the ROI, and I know that there are a bunch of calculations um, and estimates. For me, it was very simple. It was, if I can recoup the total investment within the first three years after graduation, I was very happy about it. Um, and I, and I, I don't know if I got there 100%, but I do know that it unlocked many things for me, many, many positive things that have come from my career um, due to, to having the grad education. I love that. I think that that right there, that notion of I want to recoup my investment in my MBA within three years, that's great. So I'd love to ask the students a question. If you were to go and pursue a master's degree, how many years would you would would you like for it to take? for you to recoup your your investment in that degree, post in the comment section. I'd be very curious to learn. Um, 
so you kind of answered this, but tell me the next step. So you got your next job after getting your MBA. What happened after that? How did your career grow from there? Well, from there, um, clearly I was able to take more responsibilities because my business acumen was um, was better. Yeah, my experience was also now um, sponsored or supported by by a credential that was a, a university was given to me. So as a result, I found myself in a position that had a broader scope than the one I had before. And the more that you learn, the more that the responsibility it grows. And it was just more about that. I, I have been able to demonstrate that I can, that I'm reliable. Therefore, I can have, uh, I can take on more responsibility and that I can empower my team to execute on it. So um, I think that's that's how it goes. And that mentality comes from the MBA. And I tell you why, because one of the things that we learn that is just resonates with all of us after 10 years of graduation is the, the realization while we were studying that things are really not complex. Like we think you think that you don't have time. Yes, you have time. You think things are difficult. No, they are not. Like when, once you got to stay exposed to the many different cases and circumstances and realities of other people, uh, then you realize that it actually it's not that difficult. Um, that being said, people who sign up to go to grad school, independently of what, where, what that is, um, and they put the time, it is a hard commitment. Like going to grad school is definitely hard uh, and it should be hard. And because it is hard, then you also get to learn how to be much more resilient um, as an employee. Um, I love that. That's a really good perspective, that resiliency. I love to ask the students another question real quick, post in the comment section. But what, because and, and the reason why I'm asking this is because I think a lot of students don't think about this. I think they just think, oh, this is just the natural next step. I go to get an M MBA or an MSA or an MSIS or whatever. Um, what is the biggest benefit that you want to achieve? Like, what is the biggest benefit that you believe will come to you after achieving this master's degree? Um, what Essentially, what would be your reason for getting this master's degree? Post in the comment section. I'd love to learn. Um, Henry, for you, how do you plan on using your degree as you continue to advance in your career? So um, my degree has enabled me to um, adapt to the circumstances of the business. And by that, I'm talking about the macroeconomics or the microeconomics, you know, when when recession hit years back and the financial sector was very heavily affected. I have, a, you know, um, peers from school that were in the financial sector. I wasn't in the financial sector. So I got my skills were finance related, okay? And I apply them into corporate finance rather than going into the banking side or lending side. Um, so that, that's a good one. Then when I decided to pivot from hospitality and retail to um, to technology, my 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 degree enabled me to pivot easily my financial skills and acumen, plus all the management component and international experience that I got through the MBA into bringing these new skills into the technology. And, and I have gone through metamorphosis due to the stuff that I have learned there through the, through the program. Absolutely. And I mean, and I know you've shared this with me, but even internally, it sounds like you're making transitions into new opportunities and leveraging your experience to do that as well. Do you mind maybe shedding light on how having that MBA and that degree yeah. helped you traverse internally within yeah. the organization? Yeah. For example, it's a, it's a great it's a great point to raise. So right now I'm currently with Cisco Systems and I have been um, working for them for two years in a strategy and planning role where the objective of the team, what it was built, was to support on a specific uh, part of the business. That part of the business has been integrated with another part of the business. And then as a result, there were two and a half teams doing the same responsibilities that my team had. So what you what that when that happens is you have too many leaders. Yeah. And as a result, leaders need to go and find a team to lead. So for example, right now, I'm currently going through the process of identifying and pursuing the next opportunity for me in Cisco as I have gone over a change management um, process with my other two uh, peers 
where we all three find ourselves in a situation where there has to be a consolidation and the creation of a team that works well together. So we put ahead of everything, the need for the organization, then the need for our employees and team to make sure that they they stay working, um, that the environment doesn't change even though their um, structure is changing, yeah. And, um, And that with that, then I and our peer of mine will go back into the organization and say, okay, we are ready to move to our next assignment. Yeah. And that next assignment for me might look like uh, more head finance oriented or more operations oriented or more leadership oriented. But all the, the, um, the opportunities came from the higher education that I desired to acquire. Nice. So it sounds like your MBA allowed you to be more nimble. So how did you choose which degree program and at which school was best for you? How did you make that decision making process? I think I know I want to just caveat that question with I know some employers, if they choose to pay for that, will say, hey, we're only going to pay from it from XYZ University. And this is the program we want you to go to. But it sounds like because you did it yourself, you you were a free agent. You could choose whatever degree program. How did you go about determining what was the right fit for you? So the f- the first thing is you gotta you gotta join the one that you can pay, yeah. So the first thing is dollars matter. Like there are programs for sixty thousand dollars and there are programs for two hundred thousand dollars. So I think I think that that is or even for twenty thousand dollars. So I think that is important. The second thing that was important for me was where is that school positioning their their alumni, yeah. So if you wanna work in a specific industry or in a, a specific city for example, that needs to be taken into account. A lot of the people that go to grad school in a certain city, they stay in the city or they come back to that city. Because in grad school is where um, they build deeper connections or, or more as adults you know, uh, rather than, than, than young uh, students. So I think, I think that's important. If you want to be into the industry that you want to be also matters a great deal. You know, some schools are very good in consulting. Some schools are very good on engineering. And, and I think that has a lot to do with it. So it's not one or two things. It's definitely a weight of four or five metrics that you need to analyze and say, okay, is this the whole package that I need? Um, I will argue that the location where you do it matters a great deal, um, geographically speaking. So if you do it in the Northeast, you're gonna have your opportunities are gonna be heavily focused on the Northeast. If you do it in, in Cali, in California, if you do it here in Texas, it's the same story. You come to UT. I mean, most people wanna stay in Austin and and, and go to the to the work in the companies that have been funded by UT alumni and and just being part of the of the Austin community. But um Oh, I think, I think, I don't know. I think I covered three or four things. Maybe did I answer the question? Yeah, no, that, that, that was great. That totally did. And that location you brought up, I think is really valid. So I want to ask the students one last question, post in the comment section. If you were to pursue a master's degree, what city would you want to pursue that degree and post in the comment section? I'd love to learn where you're coming from. So, so uh, Henry, what made you decide Texas? What you go from the Northeast, what made you want to come to Texas? Um, yeah. to, so yeah. So I, I, that's right. So I started my life in the States in the Northeast. Um, so I live in Boston and New York. And um, I also had the opportunity to work in, in the EU, in, in Europe, in the UK, with the English companies that are represented here in the US. One of the things that I really, really dislike about the Northeast was the winter. Um, so my wife and I, nine years ago, we took a sabbatical and we traveled around the world for, for 18 months. And as we did it, we followed the sun. So it was a year of summer, if you think about it that way. That's and one of the things that came out of that trip is we're going back to the U.S., but we're not going back to a place where there is snow. So we start to, um, so I did an analysis on like the southern states, uh, what were their projections, uh, where was the macroeconomy and the macroeconomics of it and opportunities for job. Um, and then we keep, a, we started a road trip all the way from California uh, among all different states and we got to Austin and once we got to Austin we really liked the place um, we secured an apartment in South Congress and and we decided to stay um, and so literally the reason why we stay in Austin is because we like Austin um, there was no we didn't have any job opportunities or people we knew or it was just 
Austin 10 years ago was a different town and and I think the barriers of entrance were, were very different and we just found a place and start living here and then that's that's how I ended up here in Austin Texas that's awesome I mean that sounds pretty uh pretty darn great for any of our viewers that might so I guess maybe my assumption is at this time you didn't have any children did you no, I didn't have any children. We were, we were, we were, uh, we had been married for a long time, but we didn't have any children. We started a family once we got established here in, in Austin. Got it. So if I am, let's say, an adult going back, contemplating getting my MBA or another master's degree, and I do have children, is there a way that I can go about effectively discovering what city I want to pursue or live in? And, um, yeah. Do you have any tips for people that have other constraints, life constraints? Yes. I, th I think you should. I think people should use the online programs that exist right now. I think I think serious universities, um, Princeton, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, they have they ha the MIT have very good um, online programs. I'm sure UT does as well. Isn't it? Um, so I think for individuals with kids, um, which I had experience to see my peers with kids going through a full-time program phase. I, I think it was it was very challenging for them uh, and their families, their wives and kids. It's not impossible, but it was very challenging. So for husbands but, and kids. Yes. But in today's economy, you know, where you can literally work from anywhere as long as your employer allows it or you as an individual, um, then I think the same approach applies for the education. So um, I can tell you that a lot of the programs that have a lot of digital content, um, they're also complemented by uh, some face-to-face -face deep travels, you know, like they take people to see China, for example, and what business looks like there or Mexico or Brazil. So I think there is always that opportunity to build bond with the people that you work on, even though you are not seeing them every day or every other day in the classroom. Um, so I, I definitely think that, that that's super important. That should also enable individuals to get a lower cost for education if they are open to, uh, they're focused more on the skill rather than the credential, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. Um, well, Henry, this has been fantastic. I feel like you've been a wealth of knowledge for students as they contemplate whether or not they should pursue additional education. Is there anything else you'd love to share with our students about things to think about as they're pursuing their, their next step professionally in their career paths and education? Uh, I think it's just do it. Do it because it's worth it. Um, learn more because it's worth it. And then it definitely opens doors. It, it will open more doors than the ones that you can see in front of you without it. So I, I definitely think that it's worth it and 100% supportive and encouraging everybody who wants to increase their education at any level. That is always, that is always new to learn. That's awesome. Well, Henry, thanks for being here. Students, thank you all for being here. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the next workshop. See you, everybody.